I, uh, I ask permission for, for one minute for, for this question, and that is, you have indicated that Mars had a, uh, was totally different thousands of years ago. Uh, is it possible that there was a civilization on Mars thousands of years ago? So the evidence is that um, Mars was different billions of years ago, not billions. thousands of years ago. Well, yes. That and and um, there would be – there is no evidence that uh, I'm aware of that – Would you that rule Would you rule that out? That, see, there's some people – well, anyway. I would, I would say that is extremely unlikely. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Brothers. Thanks for the good job you're doing. God bless. Thank you, Mr. Rohrbacher. Welcome to Space 2090, the Space Exploration Podcast. This podcast is for everyone enrolled in Geography 2090, Space Exploration, in the Department of Geography at Western University. My name is Danny Bednar. I'm a part-time assistant professor in the Department of Geography at Western, as well as an analyst with the Canadian Space Agency in Ottawa, Ontario. This week we're talking Mars, more specifically in this episode, Martian Science, with professional Martian Tanya of Mars, Dr. Tanya Harrison. Tanya has a PhD in geology with a specialization in planetary science from Western University. She's worked on a host of planetary science missions, including NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter from 2008 to 2012. She was also a science team collaborator on NASA's Mars Exploration Rovers, so Spirit and Opportunity, and a former operations team member on NASA's Curiosity Rover, which is still roving the planet today. Tanya has an extensive background researching Martian science, but more recently has turned her attention to both the Earth and her new role with Planet Labs, and the Moon, where she has just co-authored her first book with none other than yours truly, retelling global experiences of the Apollo 11 landing. I sat down with Tanya last week during the International Astronautical Congress in Washington, D.C., we were both pretty tired from nearly a week of conferencing at this point, but we still had a wonderful chat about the history of Mars, its major features, and some of the key missions that have helped us understand the Red Planet. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Tanya Harrison on this week's first of two podcasts for Space 2090. I hope you enjoy, and as always, make sure to take good notes. All right, Space 2090, um, for the first time in a little while, I have a guest with me for this week's podcast, and aligned with this week's theme of exploring planets, we're talking about Mars. So I have with me uh, my friend Tanya Harrison, Dr. Tanya Harrison, uh, who did her PhD at the same university I did, and the same university you're attending right now, and that is Western. She's worked on a variety of missions across the space sector, and I'll let her talk about that. And she's currently working for Planet Labs. Labs. <laughs> That's okay. um, so without further ado, here is Tanya of Mars. Tanya, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So what have you worked on in regards to Mars? So my experience has mostly been in mission operations. I worked in mission ops for the context camera and the Mars color imager aboard the Mars reconnaissance orbiter for NASA. And then all the color cameras aboard the Curiosity rover and the Opportunity rover. And then I have a lot of Mars research experience as well in geomorphology, so study of shapes of features on the surface to tell you about how they might have formed in the geologic history of particular areas. Right, so you play a detective with Mars essentially. Yeah, basically. Like the surface, and this is the thing with planetary science in general, is we're looking at things that typically happened a long time ago. And we're trying to figure out what would have made that look like that and essentially then put the pieces together as to what the environment was when that whatever it is landslide uh, lake bed formed 
Exactly. It really is almost like a crime scene. You only have the pieces of what was left behind. So you have to try to take that and extrapolate what might have left all those pieces there in the first place. So this week, well, actually last week, the students read about the formation of the solar system, which is really the ultimate detective story for a planetary scientist because they're looking at all the planets and the hints here and there about how they all got there and how this whole thing kind of came together. Um, Mars doesn't have a particularly interesting origin story, at least not maybe compared to the Earth and the Moon, um, but what is Mars's kind of origin story in regards to the rest of the solar system? It's pretty much your run-of-the-mill origin story for all the terrestrial planets, so the inner rocky planets. You had a bunch of material that accreted slowly over the course of time to form Mars. The interesting thing is that it's kind of at a point with this strange gravitational interaction with Jupiter. And so that has had maybe some effect on its formation and might have also led to the formation of its moons. So unlike some cases like Earth's moon, where it actually formed from accretion due to an impact from a large body with the Earth, uh, or planets that form from accretion of stuff orbiting around them, like maybe the moons of Saturn or Jupiter, the moons of Mars look like they could possibly be captured asteroids that were likely flung toward the inner part of the solar system because of this gravitational interaction between Mars and Jupiter. Yeah, so we, we talked about Phobos and Deimos, and, and we don't want to talk about them too much this week because we're focusing on planets, but it is really strange. I mean, they look like asteroids. They kind of act like asteroids other than the fact that they orbit a planet. Um, is that really the main hypothesis for what they are? It's the one that most people gravitate toward, too. There's another idea that they might be little bits that were actually ejected from Mars during a large impact. Maybe something like what formed the massive Hellas or Argyre impact basins that we see on the surface. But it's kind of hard to tell, so hopefully uh, in 2024 or so, Japan is planning on sending a mission called the Martian Moon Explorer, MMX. It'll be the first time that we've ever actually visited the moons of Mars, and hopefully it'll shed some light on the answer of where these moons might have come from. So, yeah. So Mars doesn't have this crazy impact of Thea that Earth has. Um, and another ramification is that it didn't go undergo, so far as we know, this kind of like second gigantic melt event that Earth has. So that's one of the things it has not in common with the Earth. It looks obviously way different from the Earth. It looks way different from Venus. What happened between when it formed and today, obviously that's like 4 billion years of history, so I don't expect you to cover all of that. But clearly some things happened along the way that we have some sense of, we don't know for sure, that led to Mars being the way it is, it being kind of the cold, the cold sibling of the, of the, of the rocky planets. Um, and much different than its kind of Earth and Venus counterparts. The general thought, kind of skimming over lots of the minutia of what happened on Mars, is that because Mars is so much smaller than the Earth, its core cooled off more quickly. And on Earth, we have our liquid core to thank for the magnetic field that protects us from things like the solar winds uh, and galactic cosmic rays to some extent. Uh, but on Mars, we think that the core might have solidified, and so it doesn't appear to have much of a magnetic field left. And slowly, as the magnetic field was fading away, it lost that protective property. And so the solar wind essentially blew away the atmosphere of Mars. At that point, you didn't have, uh, at that point, you didn't have conditions that were conducive to keeping water stable on the surface. And so a lot of it ended up either evaporating away, kind of lost to space, or it percolated into the ground and is still there today as this huge ice layer that we call the cryosphere. And we've seen little bits of that exposed due to different processes over time. Um, but we think that's how it went from this transition of being maybe a warm and wet environment where it was much more like Earth. You had flowing rivers, you had lakes. There was potentially an ocean, although it's a little bit controversial to this place we see today where there's only maybe a hint of liquid water here and there in very limited places, but for the most part, the water is just locked up in ice. So, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about again a little bit, the warm and wet, because of course, whenever that comes up in the media, it gets a lot of attention and, and all of the images that kind of try to recreate that are quite famous. But this idea of if there were water or the, the ingredients for water, 
It either went up or down. Kind of. Right. Down and frozen or up and away. Um, and it, it speaks to this kind of delicate balance we need with planets where you very quickly run into like a runaway system where there's not enough moisture in the atmosphere to keep high enough pressure to have surface water, which means there's not enough liquid around for an atmosphere. Like you get into these runaway cycles and there's no stopping it at some point. Right. It's, it's a runaway effect. So we have seen this underground ice and we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about uh, some of the missions that have been to Mars. This idea that, and I'm thinking of famously the instance where someone in I think the House of Representatives asked about Mars being warm and wet hundreds of years ago. <laughs> and it was, uh, I don't remember who the scientist was, it might have been Gavin Schmidt, who's actually an Earth climate scientist, um, said, no, that was billions of years ago. If it was warm and wet, when when roughly was that and, and what was going on? It looks like that transition might have happened around three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago. Again, we're not entirely sure what happened at that point to trigger that unless that's when the core just completely started to cool off. But we see a really nice transition in certain places like Gale Crater where the Curiosity Rover is where we can actually see that transition in the landforms on the surface from uh, stuff that's been carved by liquid water, we see little canyons and whatnot, to things that are only touched by wind and there's no evidence of water having been there at all. So I'm really fascinated then where Mars is right now. It's almost like Earth, but not quite. It has an atmosphere, but it's not a good one. Um, What's the deal with Mars's atmosphere right now as it stands? So Mars's atmosphere is significantly thinner than the Earth's. So Earth's is uh, one bar and Mars is six millibars. So significantly thinner. And it's mostly made up of carbon dioxide with some trace amounts of water, oxygen, uh, water in form of water vapor, obviously, um, argon, some other little bits of stuff here and there. Um, so we don't have nearly the concentration of oxygen that we would see in the Earth's atmosphere. And there's not a lot of nitrogen, which people don't tend to talk about very much, mm -hmm. but 70% of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen. And so that's something that we're really missing on Mars. Yeah, so Mars, I mean, I'm not a geochemist, but it, I'm often struck by how simple a lot of the other planets are, really. Um, like Earth has this ridiculous amount, this mix, it's like really fine-tuned and there's all these trace elements in our atmosphere and I'm sure there's trace elements in Mars's atmosphere as well but when you really look at Mars from a distance it's like six different elements it seems. Yeah I think some of that is probably just because there hasn't been a lot of geologic activity anytime recently so on Earth we constantly have volcanoes erupting and I mean we have a lot of human emissions of various gases we have a lot of animal emissions of various gases, and these are all contributing to our atmosphere, but there hasn't been any active volcanism on Mars for, depending on who you ask, at least 10 million to 100 million years. And in that time, the atmosphere of Mars has still been stripped away. The, the solar wind is stripping away the atmosphere as we speak at this very moment. So um, if there were more complex things in the atmosphere early on that were being replenished by these processes, they mm -hmm. might just be gone today. So the surface then, let's get down to the surface. That's the atmosphere. There are some features on Mars and I often, when I talk to students about them, I try to, I use an earth centric approach. So like if you were looking at it, at the entire sphere of Mars, Ballast Marinaris kind of runs across what would be the Atlantic if we were looking at the North American side. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, what are these kind of major features that the students may even be familiar with that we typically see or hear about on the surface of Mars? I mean, generally, if you're looking at the side where you have Valles Marineris, you generally can see really clearly like three dark spots. And those are the Tharsis Montes. They're three incredibly large volcanoes, generally larger than anything that we see on the Earth. And if you've got the right angle, you can also see Olympus Mons, a fourth dark spot, which is the tallest volcano in the solar system. It's three times taller than Mount Everest, and the base is basically as large as the state of Missouri. Um, then you have Valles Marineris itself. Um, which is 
a gigantic canyon the size of the United States, right? Well, a canyon is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, so in geologic terms, a canyon is carved by water. Well, okay, so, so let it's, me take a stab. Is it a rift or a... Well, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's more like a rift. If you, you can't necessarily tell very well unless you look at maybe a structural map of Mars or an elevation map. But all around the Tharsis area, it's such a large volcanic bulge that it created all these radial cracks mm. moving away from it. And Valles Marineris looks like it's just one of those cracks, but because of the rocks that are underneath it, they're really soft and easily erodible. Um, and then it looks like there's been a bunch of action from wind and maybe a little water and some glaciers. Uh, that just happens to have be been, it happens to have become the largest of this fracture system. Um, but it doesn't appear that it was carved, you know, from end to end by a river, like right. unlike something like the Grand Canyon here on Earth. And it's sort of a positive feedback system in that over time you had lots of landslides on the walls, which just made this thing grow and grow and grow over the course of the last four billion years. Like again, whenever I hear planetary scientists talking about what we know about a body, again, it just always reminds me of, of this Pickford case or of. of crime scene investigation because you get part of the picture and then this is like what you were explaining okay that had to have taken place at a certain time so based on what we know about what's around it we now have to fit it into the timeline of mars and if it doesn't work well with some other issues that when we think maybe some other features are formed now we have a problem mm -hmm. and that's one of the most fascinating things to me about planetary science is it you do the science, but then you have this, that's geology as a whole, I guess. You have this problem of, okay, well, when did this thing happen that I'm looking at? And if a bunch of other things happened, and we see this literally with cratering on top of it, well, clearly those were after. But then you get really confusing things sometimes. Yeah. Um, and that that's really, really fascinating. I want students to understand that, that planetary science is, is really this mix of of science and interpretation and then often a lot of arguing and a little bit of an art form as well you mm. just look at so many things you are able to put the pieces together because you say oh this looks like something i've seen on earth or right. this looks like something i've seen on this part of mars and so having that knowledge of how to tie those things together is really helpful well that's another good point is like these are all kind of universal geological processes for the most part, like other than something like cryovolcanism, which I don't know if we have that on Earth. In a... uh, not on Earth, no. Yeah, There's so we know. <laughs> yeah, but most of these things are things we know of on Earth, and we can study them very closely. And, and there's a relationship between Earth sciences and planetary sciences. Obviously, we know what a river delta is because of Earth, and then when we see one on Mars, we go, "Oh, we know how those things form." Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really interesting how planetary scientists really take geology, which is literally the study of earth and throw it at other planets. And sometimes it sticks and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. It, it can be tricky because we can see things that we think we know how they form because we see them on earth, but then you think about the conditions that you have on these other planets mm. and it doesn't quite work out so well. Like we have features on Mars that look like they were carved by liquid water during times when liquid water shouldn't have been stable right. on the surface. So trying to explain how that happens is tricky. Are our climate models wrong? Was liquid water mm -hmm. actually stable and we just don't know it? Was this carved by some other exotic process that we don't know about because the conditions on Earth are different? Um, you know, these are a lot of things we're trying to figure out because the more we learn about Mars, like the more images that we get, the more data we get from the surface, it it throws us more curveballs. Like we thought we knew a lot more than we actually mm. do. Yeah, and that's crazy because Mars is, is certainly the planet we know best other than Earth. Um, we know the moon pretty well. The moon's a lot simpler um, and a lot easier to understand for the most part. But I mean, if, if you think there's a lot of mysteries with Mars, which there are, um, there, pretty much every other body has equal amounts of mysteries or maybe lesser only in the fact that we just haven't explored enough to know what we don't know. Yeah. Uh, Mars, we're in a position where we know a lot, which means we now know enough to know we don't know a lot. Um, so we've talked about the atmosphere and the surface. 
below the surface, you already talked about it, the core. What's the deal with Mars's core? Obviously, Earth has this very active magnetic core, largely nickel turning, providing an electromagnetic shield. Um, what's, the, what's going on at Mars? We don't know a lot about the interior of Mars, actually. We thought we had a good idea for quite a while. We were pretty sure the interior of Mars was dead. You know, we haven't seen any volcanoes erupting. We weren't seeing a magnetic field, so we assumed the core was solid. The interior composition of Mars is pretty similar to Earth, but there's a lot more sulfur for some reason. Um, but then when we got, uh, we sent the MAVEN mission to Mars, which is the Mars Atmospheric and Volatile Evolution Mission, uh, in 2014, it discovered traces of an aurora, so like mm. the northern lights at Mars. And we know from Earth that that has to form by the solar wind interacting with the magnetic field. So that really, again, threw us a curveball. We had to figure out, okay, how is this forming? There shouldn't be a magnetic field. Why didn't we see this before? So now we also have the InSight lander on the surface that is trying to basically drill into the subsurface and see if there's any, uh, what we call a geothermal heat flux. So is there any interior heat coming out of the planet that could be generated by activity in the core or maybe some really low level volcanic activity that isn't actually making it to the surface, but maybe you do still have some pockets of magma that are sloshing around mm -hmm. in there. There's not very warm or there's not enough pressure for them to erupt. Um, so hopefully we'll figure out some new information with that mission. Um, and then when you get closer to the surface, there's actually buried ice. When you're at the higher latitudes, it's really close to the surface. We were able to dig it up with the Phoenix Lander about 10 years ago. Uh, we've seen new impact craters that have formed over the last decade that have actually excavated this ice and, and um, you know, brought it from the subsurface onto the surface where we can see it from orbit. Um, but then as you get closer to the equator, it's warmer, obviously, and so that ice is only stable at deeper and deeper locations as you move toward the equator. So we don't have a great idea of how deep it is and how much there is. Once you get maybe equatorward of about 40 degrees latitude in either hemisphere. So that's something we're trying to learn more about with things like ground penetrating radar, because that's going to be really important if we want to send humans in the future mm -hmm. to actually use that water for drinking or making rocket fuel. And this is one of the other challenges of robotic exploration and even hum human exploration to an extent as well. If there are pockets of heat in the Mars subsurface, we'd be really lucky if we landed on one. Exactly. I mean, on Earth, we're kind of lucky in that there are obviously places that are warmer than others, mm -hmm. Hawaii being a good example. But we have this sort of latent geothermal heat flux throughout a lot of the planet. But we know from looking at other places in the solar system, like um, Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, for example, it's only generating heat at its south pole, where it has these geysers shooting mm -hmm. out of you know, liquid water and vapor and ice. Um, so you could have some very localized spots. Maybe the InSight lander is not at a spot where you have that heat flux and we're going to miss it. Or maybe it is at one of those places, but it will give us the wrong idea of what the heat flux of Mars is because we'll try to take that and generalize it to the whole planet when it's really only maybe applicable to that area because they landed near a volcanic province that's really kind of flat and boring farther away from the volcanoes themselves. Yeah, so, I mean, another thing to keep in mind with planetary science is we are sampling often very small areas, at least with robotic landers and rovers. That's the, the benefit of global orbiters is that we do get a better, or even though we don't touch the, the object, we, could, we remote sense the entire body and, and help to get some sense of, uh, of what's going on. Um, so, speaking of which, you mentioned a couple missions there, MAVEN and the current InSight mission. They're not the first, obviously, there's been a long history of Martian exploration. I guess kind of where it all started is the Mariner program, um, at least for our purposes. Um, you know, and it's hard to imagine that before the Mariner program, there were still quite a few, what we would now think of as very obvious questions about Mars uh, that people didn't know about. Uh, do you remember, or, or off the top of your head, what do you know about the Mariner program and, and kind of what it taught early on in the 1970s about, and 60s about what was happening on Mars? 
I mean, there was still a contingent before the Mariner missions that thought maybe Mars had these lush jungles and canal systems, thanks to folks like Percival Lowell. And so we were, you know, we had these grandiose ideas of what Mars could be. Then in 1964, we sent the Mariner 4 mission, which was a flyby mission past Mars, and it revealed a pretty dull cratered surface that looked a lot, a lot like the moon. And I think it kind of shattered a lot of people's dreams because it didn't turn out to be very exciting compared to what we thought yeah. Mars could be in the long run. And then we sent Mariner 6 shortly later and Mariner 7, and it was the same thing. We just so happened to fly all of those missions over the cratered southern highlands of Mars. So they missed Bowles Marineris, mm -hmm. they missed all of the large outflow channels, they missed all the large volcanoes. So all of the really exciting stuff, these missions just happened to fly past. And if we had just taken those to be, oh, this is what Mars is, and stopped going there, for example, mm -hmm. we would have missed so much. And then in 1971, we sent Mariner 9, which was the first mission to go into orbit. So it could actually map the entire planet. And that completely revolutionized our view. It discovered Val's Marineris, so that's how it got its name, Mariner Valley, named after Mariner 9. We discovered all these large volcanoes, massive outflow channels that are larger by many orders of magnitude than anything we've ever seen on Earth. Uh, polar caps that we've been able to see from Earth through telescopes. We finally actually got to see the structure of them, figure out what they were made out of. So this completely changed our view. <laughs> Unfortunately, when we got there, we also arrived in the middle of a massive dust storm. So for a few months, we couldn't even see the surface with Mariner 9. So we also got to learn a little bit about the atmospheric dynamics as well. Yeah, and, and Mars, you know, even though it has a super, super thin atmosphere, it still has weather. Um, and as many students have now submitted in their first assignment, doesn't have powerful enough weather, as we see in the beginning of the movie, The Martian, um, but there are pretty, kind of pretty typical weather patterns. Um, and I think the Mariner program was a big part, a big part of kind of understanding that. Um, although astronomers for a long time could see what they figured were clouds. Yeah, we could actually see these uh, dust storms and some water ice clouds through telescopes all the way back to the days of Cassini. Hmm. Um, I think the earliest mention of ochre colored hazes is mm -hmm. in like the 1860s from Flower de Jay or something like that. Um, both of whom have craters named after them on Mars now mm -hmm. thanks to their scope. So I, I have to jump back, I forgot. You mentioned that the early Mariner missions imaged a kind of boring part of the northern hemisphere of Mars um, that looks a lot like the moon actually, and that's because it's heavily cratered. Um, no, the southern hemisphere. Sorry, the southern yeah. hemisphere of Mars. Um, and that relates to Mars's kind of hemispheric divide. Um, what is that hemispheric divide? So we call this the dichotomy boundary and the Northern hemisphere of Mars is really smooth. There's only a few hundred craters over a, a couple kilometers in diameter. And it looks like it's covered in maybe ancient lava flows from some of the big volcanoes that we have in the northern hemisphere. And then sort of snaking along the equator, uh, there's a really, really abrupt transition to this really cr heavily cratered highland terrain that is very old and just completely pockmarked. And there are, there are a few ideas of where this, this boundary might have come from. One is that there was a giant impact that um, created this huge difference between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. It might have actually been enough that if that boundary was not at the equator, the planet reoriented itself so that that became the equator after the impact. Um, another idea is that that Northern part of Mars was at one point a giant ocean, and so that could have stopped impact craters from forming. We've actually never found any evidence of shorelines along that dichotomy boundary, and that's been the biggest sticking point for that explanation. You'll see lots of beautiful renderings yeah. of Mars when it was warm and wet that include the entire hemisphere, the yeah. entire northern hemisphere being an ocean. And it's convenient. You have a lot of channels that empty into the northern hemisphere from what we can tell today, but we're not seeing any evidence of right. where that ocean might have been. And so that's, that's tricky because on Earth, shorelines are very obvious features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we started after the Mariner program, um, 
Well, we got lucky. We had some successful landings. And this was, we've heard about the biking program in this course because it was a big part of the post-Apollo agenda of NASA. Um, but in 1976, Viking 1 was successful at, at Mars. And it, it itself certainly revolutionized uh, our understanding of Mars. It gave us a color image of the surface of Mars um, and even began to dig into the subsurface, sort of. Um, what do you what do you think about when it comes to the Viking missions? I mean, these were really important because we wanted to answer the question of, about whether or not Mars ever had life, and so these missions were sent with these life detection experiments to try and answer that question, looking for organic material, looking for signs of metabolic activity that you know microbial life might leave behind. And unfortunately, we didn't find anything, but we realized along the way that we didn't design the experiments very well. And so the experiments we sent, if they had found life or organic material, would have actually destroyed it in the process. So it was, it was a learning curve. We sent different experiments with future missions, uh, but they still taught us a lot about the geology of Mars. We got to measure the composition of the atmosphere for the first time from the ground, which is what allowed us to realize that some of the meteorites that we actually found here on Earth came from Mars because they had trapped pockets of gas in them. And the composition of that gas exactly matched mm. the composition the Viking leaders were measuring of the Martian atmosphere. We also got some measurements of the wind, thanks to seismometers that were on Viking that didn't actually reach the ground, so they became oh. wind sensors instead <laughs> by accident. Um, and with uh, Viking 2, which landed a little farther north than Viking 1, we got to see um, frost on the surface of Mars. So that was pretty cool. You can see it from orbit sometimes, but then you see it from the surface. It was pretty amazing. So Viking missions were successful. Those were, of course, uh, orbiters and landers, for those of you keeping track. So the Mariner program was uh, an or well, flyby and then an orbiter program. Uh, Viking had both an orbiter and a lander as part of the two missions. And then in the 80s, we decided that Mars wasn't interesting and we were just going to hang out around Earth with our space shuttle. Um, and really nothing happened at Mars in the 1980s for the most part, right? Yeah, we didn't have any active... Well, I think Viking... At least one of the orbiters and maybe one of the landers were still functional into the very early 80s. Yeah. And then there was nothing for the rest of the 80s into the early 90s. And part of that would probably be the hangover from... I mean, you can imagine the Apollo program was just gigantic and then we had Voyager uh, which just revolutionized planetary science as a whole giving us images of the entire well really the entire solar system um, and then we had the Viking missions and Mariner so I mean it's not there was probably a dearth of data to work with throughout the 80s it probably sucked that there was no new stuff coming in mm -hmm. but with with Voyager Viking and even probably some of the well certainly some of the Apollo stuff still um, the 80s were probably still good for planetary science, it just wasn't anything new. Yeah, we certainly had a ton of data to work with, but I mean, humans always want the fancy yeah. new thing. Um, so we did get some new things in the 90s, including what I know is, is the rover that inspired you to get interested in Mars. Um, and it, well, part of this mission is also in the movie The Martian. Um, what caught your eye about Mars in the 1990s? Um... I mean, like you said, so the Pathfinder mission is what really got me interested in Mars, and it landed on 4th of July of 1997, and this was a lander that sat down on the surface of Mars, and it unfolded like a little flower, and then this tiny shoebox-sized rover called Sojourner drove off of it. And basically the rover would drive around, and it did some little chemical analyses of the rocks, and just walked up and like, pooped them, and it would send the data back to the the lander and the lander would transmit the data back to Earth. And uh, it operated for a lot longer than we expected it to, 120 something days, I believe, uh, for a 90 day mission. And we landed in a place that from orbit we thought was the mouth of one of these giant outflow channels mm -hmm. that I mentioned before. Um, and we realized as soon as we landed, we could see that all the rocks there were rounded, and that usually signifies that they've been. Um, Weather modified, yeah, by either wind or water, and so we assumed that these were modified by water, um, and so that it's really good to have that what we call ground truth in geology. It's easy to make interpret; it's not easy, but you can make a lot of interpretations from satellite images. 
But if you don't have the data on the ground to confirm what you're seeing, there's still a little bit of speculation there. And this was the first rover that we'd ever successfully sent to another planet, like not counting things that we sent to the moon. So it was a pretty yeah. big deal for space exploration in general. It was, it was, yes, it was the first planetary rover. Planetary rover. But it was not the first rover. The great glorious Lunacod 1 <laughs> and 2 were the first rovers, and they were amazing. Beyond the moon. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I always forget, I mean, I don't forget about Sojourner, but I always, I never think of it as like a long duration mission, and I guess that's probably because of the, the MERS, which we'll talk about um, briefly and much more with our other podcast this week. With, um, they kind of shattered expectations of how long a rover should work. Yeah, compared to Mer, Sojourner was just up to the point yeah. of an eye. And, you know, was the spirit and opportunity, the two Mars exploration rovers, they lasted 10 and almost 15 years, respectively. And both of those were only meant, or expected to last 90 days. So they just blew everybody's expectations out of the water. They were just the little rovers that couldn't die until the spirit, unfortunately, got stuck in some sand 10 years in. And we couldn't get it out, and uh, opportunity was brought down by the strongest dust storm that we've ever seen on Mars. Yeah, they both had like very Canadian ends to their. One got stuck in the snow, and the other one got washed out in the snow in a blizzard. Basically. Now it wasn't snow; it was sand. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets but, everywhere. Yeah, no sand. I mean. That's that's the one hazard on Mars, I guess. In the unlikely event they get hit by a meteorite, um, yeah, the but, dust will get you. In the yeah, the dust will always get you on Mars. Um, and for humans, there's a lot more hazard. But for rovers, it's it's really just the dust and the temperature. Um, so we the Mars the Mars exploration rovers are kind of what follows up, and and these are launched by NASA in 2003, um, and and arrive. They land in different areas. There's two of them, Spirit and Opportunity. I hope you're familiar with them. They have kind of V-shaped um, solar panels over the surface and the mass, the cameras that are kind of hoisted on a mast um, that kind of look like eyeballs. Um, so they're very cute little things and, and they, they broke all the rules when it came to operating machines on the surfaces of other planets because like, like Tanya just said, they weren't supposed to last. They were 90 day missions mm -hmm. and they lasted over a decade, both of them. We, we only just recently said goodbye to opportunity. And so the, the, the MERS, I don't want to talk too much about them because I expect we'll also talk about them with Raymond, but um, you had an opportunity to work in and around those missions. What, what's it like to work on a rover mission um, and, and what kind of work were you doing? It's really interesting because you get very emotionally attached to them in a way that you don't get attached to the orbiters. I mean, I worked on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter every day for longer than I worked on Opportunity, but I felt so much devastation when we lost Opportunity. Like, I cried. I literally cried. And I don't think I'll cry when Mars, Mars is great. Or, um, I don't think I'll cry when um, MRO dies on the oh, Reconnaissance yeah. Orbiter. Um, just because you can't really... You don't anthropomorphize but, the orbiters. Yeah, so if we put cute little eyeballs on orbiters, would... Then it might be different, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like with the rovers, you're interacting with them on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a very labor-intensive thing compared to the orbiters. And so it's like part of your daily life for, you know, in this case, years on end. I mean, some people got married because of opportunity, had children. Mm -hmm. The woman that was the deputy manager of the mission by the time it ended was in high school when the rovers landed, which is pretty incredible. Um, I was an undergraduate and when they landed and I had finished my PhD a couple of years before I started working on opportunities. So like a huge amount of time went by in there. Um, I forgot what the second part of your question was. Um, what were you doing? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it might help. Uh, so I worked in operations for the, uh, the panchromatic cameras or pan cam, mm. which is basically the color eyes of the rover. So taking um, pictures of the scenery around it so we could kind of localize where we were, look at the geology and figure out what we were driving through. You know, was this something formed by water or by wind? Um, and just kind of trying to figure out the whole story of the, the place that we decided to land on Mars with this rover. 
I mean, that's, I hadn't really thought of that. Yeah, so, I mean, there is turnover on, on missions. I mean, often the, a mission, a primary investigator or the head of the mission will often stick around. Um, but a lot of the main team members move around and, and move to different projects. So with a 15 year project, yeah, like you said, you could be a, a 35 year old legitimate Mars expert and you were 20 when the thing launched, or even you could be a 30 year old expert and you were 15 yeah. when this thing launched, like you weren't even thinking about working on NASA. And that's, that's really weird to think about that. I mean, there's, you know, kids taking this class or 15 year olds right now who could be the mission manager on 2020 when it wraps up or something. Yeah, I certainly never, when I saw Spirit and Opportunity land, I was like, wow, I want to work on rovers like that. But I certainly never expected to work on those same yeah. rovers, you know, years later. Yeah, and, and we can assume the technology is only going to get better and they're only going to last longer. Hopefully. I, I prefer the moon, I guess. Well, actually, or Earth. I mean, Earth is my favorite planet by <laughs> far. My interest in planets is really quite proportional to how close they are to me. So <laughs> Earth is by far the most important and of interest. Venus is very, very interesting. And sometimes Mars is equally or more interesting. Depending on the yeah. moon's closer than any given time. <laughs> Depending on the orbital mechanics. Um, you know, Mars is obviously cool and, and, and has a ton of attention, although that's shifted a little bit in the last year or so. Is there teams in planetary science? Like, I think when I got into the world, the community, I'm not going to try and get you in trouble or anything, but <laughs> like there's Team Moon and Team Mars are by far the most, I don't want to say at each other's throats, but they're the biggest teams because they're the ones who have the most legitimate shots at missions and funding and all that. Yeah. And then there's like poor little Team Venus with like a hundred or hundreds of researchers as opposed to thousands with, with Mars and the Moon. Um, and then we'll get, you know, uh, Icy Moons is a pretty popular team, Gas Giants. Um, so. Yeah, what's, what's it like being a planetary scientist? You're very clearly Team Mars. <laughs> I mean, you of course respect your colleagues from across the planetary sciences, but um, yeah, what's, what's that like, that kind of dynamic of the planetary science community? I think there's definitely a lot of contention, mostly because of the limited funds. I don't think it's that people think that one thing is necessarily more important or more interesting than another other than their own interests, you know, some people are just really passionate about Saturn or really passionate about the moon. But since there's so little funding from NASA to go around, it tends to go toward things that are doable. So it's easy to get to the moon in the relative sense that you can get there quickly. Mars, you can get there every two years. If you're going to, you know, Jupiter, it takes you five, six years to get there. Saturn, it's like seven years to get there. So you have to have a lot more money and time while well, these both these things go together. If your mission mm -hmm. is to take seven years, that's seven years of operations cost right there that you don't have if you're going to Mars, for example. So there's contention, I think, over just the resources. And I think there's some jealousy over the amount of data that people get to work with in terms of the moon and Mars compared right. to, I remember seeing a presentation in a conference once about a single swath of radar data from Europa, I think it was, from Cassini. And it was the only, the yeah. only swath they were ever going to get from that entire mission, which lasted like 20 years. And that was so heartbreaking compared to something where like, with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, there were some weeks when we would get 200 plus images a day from the context camera. You know, and that's, that's sad because there's so much cool stuff in the outer yeah. solar system that I would love to see. And that's why we really need some advances in propulsion technology and power technology. So yeah. we can try to get out there faster and more efficiently. And stay up there, right? Like, yeah, we need like more Cassini level things to Uranus and Neptune to figure out what the heck yeah. is going on out there. Well, that's just it, right? Like depth versus breadth. Like I, I would love the breadth of 
exploring Neptune and Uranus more because we pretty much know nothing about them. Mm-hmm. But Especially their moons. Well, There's probably yeah. moons we don't even know about. Well, they're just, yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we keep finding moons at Mars or Saturn and Jupiter. Yeah. Um, but then the depth is also there too. Like you said, look at all the mysteries of Mars and we've been staring at the thing for 40 years or the moon even, which it's the simplest body kind you can have in a solar system. It's a rocky, oh, it's a large rock, um, but it itself has a ton of mysteries. So then you could imagine something like Enceladus or Titan, these complex worlds. So they're super far away and super hard to image. Um, and they're yeah. unlike anything. Like with Mars, at least we have the common knowledge mm-hmm. of these are features that we see on Earth. Right. We know yeah. what a volcano looks like. We yeah. know what a channel looks like. Enceladus, we're just like, well, what the heck is going on there? Yeah. How like, are you we don't have a way to understand it. It's like trying to speak to somebody without a common language. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, we, we have one moon shooting water into space. We have another moon that's lakes are made out of liquid methane. And then we have another moon with, we think, a global glacier covering everything. And these cracks where water, this is Europa, you know, shoots to the surface and brings with it whatever's underneath. And we, space whales. Yes, we, you know, <laughs> I mean, we'd, we'd love to find out what's there. But uh, this is a challenge of planetary science. But it's also, I think, what keeps people interested, like, that's why I'm interested in planetary science, even though I'm not a practicing planetary scientist. I just love hearing more and more of the mystery. Like to me, it's like watching, you know, people are obsessed with CSI or like true crime podcast. But like that's what planetary scientist science is to me. It's just like, oh, what did we learn now? Yeah, and forensic like, files, Venus edition. Exactly. And like, <laughs> what does it cancel out or what kind of new fights does it start? Like, what, I can't remember what it was recently about, um, you know, subsurface ocean on, on Mars and things like that. I mean, you can say that and you can have even pretty good evidence for it, but there's going to be a whole lot of evidence against it because mm-hmm. there's all this other research that's already taking place. Um, and, or, you know, sometimes we'll see very cla- or shiny articles, uh, like Mars was warm only millions of years ago. Well, that doesn't line up with everything, but... Okay, so completely changing now. Obviously, this this well, you don't know this, mom. Maybe you do know this. One of the assignments is movie fact check. Uh, we've talked about the Martian quite a bit in this class already. That was like the first thing the students went to. <laughs> but as a Mars nerd, obviously you've tried to watch as many Mars movies as you can keep up with um, when you're not keeping up with real, like actual <laughs> Mars information, uh, which is by far more important. So favorite Mars movie that's not The Martian, unless The Martian isn't your favorite movie, um, and and favorite Mars movie moment. Well, I think The Martian is my favorite Mars yeah. movie because most Mars movies are really bad when you think about them, like yeah. Mission to Mars, Red Planet, yeah, those are terrible. Terminator, like none of them are very... Terminator? Not, some of it's on Mars. No. Yeah. Total Recall? Total Recall, sorry, not Terminator. How dare you? Uh, it was, I uh, got my own Sports Yeah, I know. So, sorry, Total Recall. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not a stickler for scientific accuracy in yeah. movies. I don't care about that. It's it's fantasy. But, I mean, Mars just, like, it doesn't get treated well in films at all. It's just, it's a short end of the stick. So, The Martian is cool because it's like, you actually get to see Mars. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty damn realistic, which is cool. Yeah. Um, in a way that I was able to appreciate when I don't normally care about them in movies. And I think, like, I'm trying to think of any other Mars movie I've seen that I actually liked. And I can't, I can't actually think of any. Yeah, but there's always once in a while, there's like low budget ones that I didn't really hear about. Like, Last Mission on Mars with Lee Schreiber, which is like a horror movie on Mars. Oh, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, it's not that good. And then there was, (laughs) there was one with that, I can't remember his name. Mark Strong, maybe? He was a, a single astronaut on his way to Mars. And I think that's like the premise of the movie. But I don't even know if he gets to Mars. I didn't see it. My favorite Mars movie, I mean, a lot of it is Total Recall. But Total Recall is not my favorite Mars movie. Although I do really enjoy it. Um, it's Robinson Crusoe on Mars. Who, oh. Yeah. He finds a monkey on Mars and becomes <laughs> friends with him. It's very cool. Um, yeah. I don't know. Mars movies. Yeah. You know what? 
Or, I mean, the face on Mars, or the face on Mars is a big part of Red Planet. Or Mission, or Mission Mars? Mars. Mission Mars. Mars. What's, oh, Red Planet's with the Val Kilmer and, like, the killer robot. Yeah. Yeah, that bad. was stupid. Or, which, um, is it the Terminator movie that starts with, like, the crash of the Beagle 2 lander? No, it's Transformers. Transformers, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, like, con- <laughs> conflating all of my Mars movies tonight. Yeah. Yeah, I can't say I've seen... I actually don't really love The Martian. Why not? I don't know. Just Ben Affleck is so much more superior to Matt Damon. <laughs> it's mostly that. He was definitely an interesting casting choice based on the book. I didn't read the book. I don't read fiction. Read the book. You guys should all read the book. It's yeah. better than the movie. No, you get different books to read. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think that's all we really need to talk about. Um, thanks for doing this. No problem. Always happy to talk about Mars. Yeah, it's pretty easy. We're just hanging out in hotel rooms. If you guys ever have more questions about Mars and use Twitter, you can find me on Twitter as at Tanya of Mars. Tanya with an A and a Y. And I'm always happy to yeah, answer any questions about rocks and robots on the red planet. Actually, yeah, and the Twitter assignment is actually inspired by Tanya's... Uh, oh. How long is the feed? Um, I mean, theoretically, it's supposed to be about 3,700 facts by now. I'm up to 600-ish. Oh, okay. So, so she, she thought about, what, a fact a day? Uh, I tweeted a picture that said, for every like, oh. I'll tweet one Mars fact. Thinking it might get, you know, a couple dozen likes. And then Elon Musk retweeted it. So now it has about, the last time I checked, 3,700 likes. So I'm... Scraping all of the recesses of my brain for every Mars fact yeah. that I can think of. Well, maybe I'll send you along the student assignments and you can read all the bad Mars movie facts. That's true, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you did contribute yeah. some pop science or pop culture Mars facts to the thread. Yeah, so maybe I we'll did. bring you back in for another guest appearance. Um, yeah, yeah, now that we're done our book. Yeah, <laughs> all of our extra free time yeah. now. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so yeah, of course, follow Tanya on Twitter at Tanya of Mars. She has much more followers than me <laughs> and tweets much more interesting things. But less cats. Less cats, that's for sure. Um, and you can find her elsewhere on the internet. If you're organizing an event and for some reason need a Mars speaker, <laughs> uh, she's your person. And uh, so yeah, we'll see you guys next week. It, in companion with this, if you haven't already listened to it, is also a podcast with Dr. Raymond Francis, another friend of mine. Another Western alumni who now drives a real-life robot on Mars and is a dear friend of both of ours and pretty much the coolest person we know. He's great. Yep. So uh, that's your dose of Mars nerds for the week um, and two friends of mine and uh, of Western alumni. So hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next week. Thank you.